Now we will proceed to our last session for today. I want to introduce first for our presenter. Our presenter is Dr. Ramwell R. Janaleho. He is MD Program Director. And he is also a professor in IS, a seminary. And his, uh, the title of his presentation is The Advantages and Disadvantages of Mass Evangelism in the Philippines. Now, please, Doctor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm privileged to be the last presenter this, uh, this day. I have uh, narrowed down my presentation to a specific topic instead of mass evangelism, I have narrowed it down to public evangelism. And uh, later you'll have uh, the material, I have a footnote why I have uh, narrowed it down that way. Unlike in most Western countries, mass evangelism or public evangelism popularly known in the Philippines as evangelistic crusade is still an effective method of soul winning. Though this method of evangelism is not as popular as before, still quite a number of these public meetings are held every year around the country. During the 60s and 70s, the series normally done in the evenings lasts for 21 nights or even longer. However, as years go by, evangelist series were shortened to 50 nights. Nowadays, the regular series runs for 10 nights or even shorter. With the presence of television and other forms of media entertainment, holding an audience in the evenings is becoming more and more of a challenge. But in spite of the challenge, most probably, public evangelism still remains the most widely used method of soul winning here in the Philippines. Many foreign evangelists even come to the country every year with their own budget and equipment to conduct public evangelism. There is no question as to the uh, productivity of this method of evangelism for here, for we hear of hundreds and even thousands of souls baptized during a mass baptism right after a 10-day or a week-long public effort. But in spite of the success of public evangelism, there are many things to be desired to be improved in this method of soul winning. There are a number of concerns regarding this method of evangelism that need to be faced honestly and addressed accordingly. This paper is not an exhaustive treatment of the topic, but somehow attempts to identify advantages and disadvantages of public evangelism as conducted here in the Philippines. Furthermore, this paper will highlight the positive aspects of public evangelism, as well as provide suggestions on the perceived negative aspects of the same methodology. This paper is in the context of the Philippines, but may be true in some places of the world. Advantages of public evangelism. Number one, public evangelism provides an opportunity for the church members to work together and participate in soul winning. It is observed that there is an excitement among church members and the fervor to participate in evangelism is awakened when public evangelism program is being planned. Public evangelism opens many other opportunities to participate even for those who have no gifts to give Bible studies to engage in other works like conducting vacation Bible schools, preparing handbills, so on and so forth. Public evangelism number two creates an awareness in the community of the presence of the church. It does not only make the public aware of the existence of the church, but most especially about its beliefs and other functions. This is especially true when prior to or during the public evangelism series, Community outreach such as medical missions, vacation Bible schools, cooking classes, and clean-up drives are conducted by the church members. In another way, public evangelism is a form of an advertisement about the existence and activities of the church. Advantage number three, public evangelism can reach a large number of people in one time. Public preaching can draw a crowd, and consequently, more can hear the gospel in a given time. The crowd itself gathered to listen to the public preaching can arouse curiosity and interest in people around and attract them to come and join the meeting. They may not be able to have this opportunity to hear the message, 
had it not been for the opportunity offered by public evangelism. Generally, Filipinos are easily attracted to a meeting for we are sociable and gregarious people. Ingrained in the Filipino mindset is the love for gatherings and fellowship. You can observe the fiesta celebration, basketball tournaments, and even street dancing. Filipinos are always attracted to join a crowd. The more, the merrier. <laughs> Furthermore, people are hospitable, or Filipinos are hospitable people, so they are easily attracted to foreign evangelists. This explains why foreign evangelists attract larger crowds during public evangelism. Number four, advantage. Public evangelism creates Bible study interest. It is simply impossible to reach all people through personal contact, for not all are connected to any church member by any other means. However, public evangelism can reach out to people, even those who have no prior personal contact with church members. This may provide the first opportunity for someone to hear the gospel preach and awaken his interest to further study the Bible. Public evangelism can be likened to sowing seeds of truth that will germinate in due time and could lead to a harvest when follow-up visits and Bible study is done. Thus, in a proper perspective, the success or failure of a certain public preaching campaign should not only be gauged according to the number of baptisms. Number five. Public evangelism brings many members to the church. Ed Matthews is undoubtedly correct when he wrote that mass evangelism gave birth to the New Testament church. In spite of the rise of persecution, early Christian believers have given themselves to public preaching. In today's modern church, this method still works in leading thousands of people to make a decision for Christ. Public evangelism was also very popular among the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. According to Carlos Martin, since the Great Adventist Camp Meeting era, public efforts were considered a soul-winning strategy par excellence. This assertion is quite true in the context of the SDA Church here in the Philippines. There are many factors, though, that come into play as to why public evangelism brings a great number of decisions. Aside from those who are truly converted, many others may be swayed by the decision of the crowd. There is the excitement of animated singing, the attraction of a skilled evangelist, the electric atmosphere of the event. All this may contribute to, the influence, to influence the person to make a decision. The list above is just a few of the advantages of public evangelism. But in spite of these advantages, public evangelism has some disadvantages too. Number one, Public evangelism entails a lot of financial expenses and an enormous amount of resources. The scope of this, of this paper does not allow to mention all areas that need a lot of financial support in order to run the program. But it is obvious that a big budget is needed to do public evangelism. In fact, a study shows that the cost is of dubious value considering the low returns. This is according to the, sur the survey done by George Barna uh, in the reference. So he, he says that the cost is of dubious considering the low returns. One can argue that no monetary value can be attached to a soul, but there is no denying that a lot of resources invested in public evangelism that could be invested in some of other methods of evangelism that may produce even better results. This perceived disadvantage may be debatable, but the issue nevertheless demands an objective evaluation. Disadvantage number two, public evangelism sometimes overlook pre-baptismal preparation. This is inherent to the nature of the method. With the number of people attending and the limited time, consequently the aspect of pre-baptismal instructions are sometimes neglected. In public evangelism, there is always the tendency that people who come forward and present themselves for baptism at the culmination of the meetings are baptized and brought into church membership without being discipled or given thorough Bible study. Nobody should judge one's insincerity and undermine one's personal decision. But somehow in public preaching, the crowd factor can influence one's decision, so a personal pre-baptismal preparations must never be taken for granted. It is a common reason that anyone who wishes to be baptized should never be denied, lest he or she dies and will not be saved. But this argument shows a misunderstanding of the function of baptism. It seems to suggest that baptism is a means to salvation. You just look into the footnote. 
Surely in the context of teaching candidates of baptism, the fundamental doctrines before being baptized in the church argues that the idea that a person should be baptized as soon as he professed faith in Jesus Christ and then afterward be taught these special truths is a wrong conception and is contrary to the evangelist commission from Jesus Christ. In any way, Schuller does not undermine the sincerity of the people who come forward but suggests that those who take their stand on the last night of an effort should be placed in a baptismal class to be handled by the worker who follows the evangelist before they are baptized. Schuller continues that every evangelist ought to make it a definite rule never to take anyone into the church on the same day or night on which he presents himself for the first time. On the same line of thought, Burrell suggests that in preparation for baptism and membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church must be in harmony with the call of Jesus that the people first be called or be made disciples and then be baptized. After the baptism, they may continually be taught so that they are self-sufficient in their spiritual life and not dependent upon a paid clergy person. Ext except for some extreme reasons, Pre-baptismal preparations must never be bypassed. There are no shortcuts in discipling. Gibbs argues that discipleship is far more than simply to indoctrinate into a particular church or denomination. Discipleship is primarily about commitment to the Lordship of Christ. In line with this view, only committed people who are to be baptized into the fellowship of the church. Furthermore, Ellen White stressed that the right preparation of converts for baptism constitutes the very heart of all worthwhile evangelism. Evangelism is a process, not an event. Outreach programming that only targets the point of harvest is bypassing everyone at other stages of the redemptive process. White continues that the test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. It should be understood whether those who profess to be converted are simply taking the name of Seventh-day Adventist or whether they are taking their stand on the Lord's side to come out of the world and be separated and touch not the unclean thing. When they give evidence that they are fully understand their position, they are to be accepted. The importance of pre-baptismal preparations cannot be ignored. According to Ellen White, the accession of members who have not renewed their heart and reformed in life is a source of weakness to the church. This fact is often ignored. Some ministers and churches are so desirous of securing an increased numbers of numbers that they do not bear faithful testimony against unchristian habits and practices. You may notice that this is in quotation. This is not my saying. This is in close quotation. Those who accept the truth are not taught that they cannot safely be wordlings in contact while they are Christians in name. That's also in close quotation. Disadvantage number three. Public evangelism is posed with a challenge to balance, balance quantity and quality. This disadvantage is directly related to disadvantages number, uh, disadvantage number two. Number of baptisms must never be in it itself the only objective of mass or public evangelism. It must not be misunderstood that the evangelists consider baptism as the only objective of public preaching and that the number is the only thing that matters. The problem in public evangelism lies in the intentions of some team members who are eager to impress, especially visiting evangelists, by reporting a big number of baptismal candidates. This attitude could lead to employing means that could be counterproductive. Some resort to hakot system and dole outs to attract people to attend the meetings and even to be baptized. If one joins the church for the wrong reasons, there is a high probability for dropping out. The saying, how you win them is how you keep them, is quite true. I did not attribute uh, a reference to this, but I've heard this, so I put this in quotation. On the one side, to be more objective, quality and quantity growth are inseparable. Quantity without quality is false. It's short term. It can't last. Quality without quantity is self-centered and suffers in the stagnancy of arthritic religion. But then again, church growth movement emphasizes on quality growth that go beyond numbers. 
converts one into the church are not mere members but are disciples. With this in mind, pew sit sitting is unthinkable when discipleship is seen as the lifestyle of the Christian. Moreover, the balance between quality and quantity could be resolved by how one defines the ultimate goal of a specific campaign. Win Charles Arn presents a thought-provoking observation by stating that there are significant differences between evangelism and disciple-making. He explains that today, evangelism generally is intended to be a decision-making activity, not disciple-making. Success is attained by a verbal response or decision made and even an outward show of commitment. On the other hand, in disciple-making, success is achieved where a change in behavior for the better is observed in the believer. However, from the biblical perspective, there is no dichotomy between evangelizing and disciple-making. If all evangelizing is likewise a disciple-making effort, there will be no tension between quality and quantity of converts. With proper groundwork through lay involvement before the public evangelism, as well as follow-up work after the series, optimum quality and quantity can be expected. Disadvantage number four, public evangelism is faced with a challenge of membership retention. According to Ed Matthews, there is a collaborating evidence that mass evangelism struggles to retain results. There are a lot of factors put together that contribute to this phenomenon. Aside from the disadvantages numbers two and three that greatly affect church membership loss and retention, there are the reasons to be considered. One reason is the lack of follow-up work and nurture. Another may be due to the lack of personal contact established among church members. The evangelist in mass evangelism programs don't stay very long in a certain place and if no personal contact and no friendship has been established, and no thorough pre-baptismal preparations are made, it is most likely that the new believers will stop attending church. Church membership retention is directly attributed to how the new converts are discipled prior to baptism. The less emphasis that is given to discipleship, the greater will be the number of people who fail to remain in the church, in quotation. Even McGarvan notices that Adventists who have practiced a stronger pre-baptismal process hold on to converts better than those groups who only teach an initial coming to Christ. In another study, Flabel Yegli writes that in comparing active and inactive church members, it was found out that those who continued as active church members had been exposed to an average of 5.79 different Christian influence prior to commitment. Dropouts, by comparison, had seen or heard the Christian message only 2.16 times before their decision. The bottom line is, the most prominent reason why there are a lot of dropouts is because the new members were not discipled. Number five, public evangelism may lead church members to think that evangelism is an event or a program. Since mass evangelism comes only during scheduled special events rather than a consistent or being an integral part of Christian lifestyle, the member's view of evangelism may be distorted. Members may think that evangelism is merely a program that one can engage or disengage from. When there are no mass evangelism campaigns, members become adamant to evangelism. The fervor to evangelize will be awakened only when another mass evangelism program is held. Eventually, members altogether may lose the real meaning of evangelism. Public preaching must supplement, not supplant, the outreach activities of the congregation of the local church members. It must serve as a means of reaping the harvest of the seeds previous, previously sown, which has grown and allowed to mature. However, if public preaching becomes a substitute for personal evangelism, it has become, according to Michael Cassidy, both inappropriate and ineffective. In conclusion, public evangelism has many advantages that can be used to attain a worthy objective. It offers a lot of advantages that if properly used will bring great rewards in terms of soul winning. It presents a lot of opportunities for, for fulfilling the gospel commission. The method of public evangelism still works 
and therefore must not be abandoned. On the other hand, there are disadvantages that pose several problems to this method as to its effectiveness in longer terms. If these disadvantages are properly addressed, though, the method of public evangelism as a means of soul winning will be more effective. Public evangelism per se is not a problem, but rather some issues in the strategy that are counterproductive. There are disadvantages that need to be identified in order to be addressed. An honest assessment of these weaknesses in the first, is the first step in correcting this and will greatly help this method to be more effective in soul winning and membership retention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. Now we will entertain some questions. First, we will have two first, and then if we have some more time, we'll entertain one more question. Okay, yes, one, please. Could you please? We appreciate your presentation. My, uh, my, actually, this is not a question, but my comment is a sort of suggestion. You know, when, uh, we knew very well here in the Philippines that Iglesia de Cristo are not doing public evangelism, but they are very much effective in soul winning and entertaining their uh, church members. On the other hand, uh, we Adventists, we are fond of uh, public evangelism. I do not have the concrete uh, backed up of evidences, but based on my interview from some of the pastors, as you have mentioned a while ago, when the evangelists uh, leave, then after a year or two, or not even a year, few months, those who were baptized during the, the uh, public evangelism are also gone. Can we not? Uh, adopt some uh, styles of evangelism wherein like the Iglesia de Cristo will not be doing public evangelism and yet will be able to retain our members. Thank you very much for that observation. Well, of course, uh, it's not bad to copy because I think there's no copyright in method of evangelism. But uh, I should say that uh, the Iglesia de Cristo has a public evangelism, a form of, and that is pabalita, preaching. But before they bring participants to this pabalita or preaching, some sort of maybe of a three-night preaching, these are ready or converts already. They come as ready for baptism. So this pabalita or preaching is a form of a reaping campaign. And so uh, this is not uh, unique in Iglesia de Cristo. Actually, this is the method used by the early Christian church that evangelism is done personally. And then the, when public preaching comes, these people who have come together are what I call heard of the gospel prior to that. And so in this case, if we also follow, we don't need to follow maybe the Iglesia and Christo method, but we need to follow the discipleship, early church method of Bible study or soul winning. In that case, I am not against, if you will know, and I know that you did not say that I am against, but if our public campaigns or public evangelism campaigns is done for a reaping we can gain optimum or maximum results. Okay? Well, I don't want to appear very critical of uh, our, uh, the way we evangelize. Mm -hmm. But based on my personal observation, this personal, my own, okay. you see people being brought to baptismal pool. Sometimes, you know, they are not ready. And sometimes, you know, here in the Philippines, we do not tolerate... Uh, how do you call this? The earrings and the, the uh, rings. 
And sometimes it's there in the baptismal pool that the pastor says, okay, can you remove that? You know, it, it only shows mm -hmm. that people who are brought in the baptismal, baptismal pool because of public evangelism are not ready, really uh, ready. Mm -hmm. So probably we have to shift the paradigm of uh, the mental paradigm of our pastors because we cannot deny that uh, when one pastor conducts evangelism or the public evangelism is held in his place, you know, we cannot deny the fact that there is that pressure to him, you know, to come up with a certain number because reports should be uh, asked from him. And of course, I'm not saying that uh, reports are bad, mm -hmm. but as we are saying, you know, there should be some sort of uh, things that we need to straighten so that we can uh, maintain the quantity as well as the quality. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. That's it. That is why um, it should be uh, uh, emphasized pre-baptismal preparation. Should not be sacrificed in favor of quantity. Do we have another question? One more question. Uh, <coughs> Brother Turnliho, this uh, this is a thought-provoking provok presentation. We appreciate that. Uh, personally, I it has been mentioned that uh, both should be exercised. You know, public evangelism should be encouraged. But what uh, the problem that our church, as far as I can see, from my observation, is the methodology of follow-up. If, if we do have uh, evangelistic meeting, you know, sometimes we, they hear the, the evangelism being conducted and they, the, they, they come forth, honestly, for baptism. You know, just because they don't have, they have not gone through all the series of uh, the lesson, we tell them, no, you cannot be baptized. Then by the time we, we, we find them uh, ready for that series, they are already gone before baptism. So what I think we need to be balanced here, encourage public evangelism. At the same time, whenever there is a public evangelism, a follow-up nurture part must be accompanied. And I think that is where uh, our church very often uh, fails to accomplish. That's, uh, and, and so, um, actually, uh, I have done some studies in, in my mission trip to India and the retention of baptism, baptized member, you know, after one year is, you know, 93 retention compared to, uh, you know, the, the studies that I did in the division white. It's only about 52 or something like that simply because we introduce strong nurturing program. So, um, you know, right after evangelistic meeting, don't leave them unattended. In fact, I introduce what we call, you know, spiritual friendship or spiritual uh, sponsors. And that has helped a lot in my uh, public evangelism work. So, but then uh, I like your presentation very much and makes us think we have to be balanced and we have to, whenever there is public evangelistic meeting, there must be a nurturing part as part of the whole uh, campaign. In your experience, if you have an evangelistic uh, campaign, what, what nurturing program do you 
you know, have your experience uh, as part of follow-up. Would you comment on that? Thank you very much. I believe uh, we look at the issue in a very, as much as possible, in an objective way. And um, as uh, I have concluded, uh, public evangelism per se is not a problem. It's in the strategies that we employ. But um, we'd rather do pre-baptismal preparations before the uh, public evangelism. Some sort of a groundwork and then public evangelism as a campaign should only be a reaping uh, program. Because in some cases, we say we will do it later, there will be lots of, uh, I mean, some disagreements. For example, in uh, several experiences, we wait for people to be baptized to teach them about tithe giving. We wait for people to be baptized before we teach them about the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White, and later on, after the person is baptized. So I can't believe on Ellen White. And so it's, uh, it's uh, a big uh, issue. But uh, the question is how... How do we go on nurture after baptism? For me, it's prior to baptism, and then after baptism should be maintained in a pastoral class. Before baptism, there should be a pastoral class, meaning to say all evangelism will always be a church-centered lifestyle activity of the church. And so if it is a lifestyle activity of the church, mass baptism or mass evangelism could be a reaping and the cycle continues. It is not a period that public evangelism starts and it ends and there will be a lull or a, a lapse and then we, we, we start again. And uh, I should say that this is a challenge both to re-educate and re-evaluate, re-educate our pastors and also our members that they should take part in evangelism. Okay, we will entertain this question for the, as the last question. Yes, the, the challenge, for example, sometimes in the conference or local church, uh, I don't know, it's just a question to know what will be the frequency of a public evangelism for a church, for example. Because uh, if you have this grand work, and how long should it take? Because sometimes general conference have its program, and they say every church should do that. Then the division have its program. They say every church should do that. The union have a program. And then the church is bombarded by the programs, and they have to conduct those programs, those crusades. When they say that everyone should do crusade now, everyone should do what they will do. What is the frequency of all these things? What should be at least the frequency to conduct a, 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 a crusade or a public evangelism, a mass like uh, we, we do? What will be the time? Three months, six months? I don't know exactly. Uh, Dr. Esso, you want an answer? Or is there a question? As a pastor, even though I'm teaching here in the seminary, by heart I am still a pastor and evangelist. When in fact, it was only uh, 10 days ago when we concluded our public evangelism program in Indang. The, the frequency, you're asking about the frequency. I'm not in the position to answer that personally, because, but uh, uh, I would rather look into public evangelism, not an event. If we look at public evangelism as an event, all sorts of problems will come in. And so it's not an easy task because I will tell you honestly, there is a tension between the academe and the administrators, maybe silently, because sometimes they will think that the academe, we are only prescribing, we are not in the battlefield. They say we are sitting on our swivel chairs in our ivory towers when the administrators and the district leaders are in the battlefield. And sometimes we say that in, we, we are here in the academy saying, oh, you know, what you are doing is not correct. You know? it, it's not the way it should be done. So there's a tension. But honestly, if we look into the church, as this collectively is a church, and re-evaluate honestly, 
I don't know if we share, if you share my conviction, that if we, we should look into public evangelism not as a program, we will resolve many of the issues. And then tensions of numbers, goals will be resolved. And so, honestly, we know what is true. But the sad thing is, we always go back to the old way. We do it in a conventional, traditional way. But I think it takes so much pain and prayer to go back to the Bible method of evangelism. Thank you so much for your questions, for your participation. And we also thank you and we appreciate Dr. Tonelejo for your presentation. Now, I would like to ask our ATS president to present token of appreciation and certificate of appreciation. Yes. Oh. On behalf of the IS Asian Theological Society, I would like to present this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Rangwil Tonalejo for his uh, valuable presentation on the advantage and disadvantage of mass evangelism in the Philippines. During the third IS uh, Asian Theological Society Annual Forum. Thank you so much. And uh, we have uh, two announcements here. The first one is this evening, we will have the Vesper program in this place, the amphitheater. So please come uh, at 7 o'clock. We will start uh, from 7 o'clock. And uh, Dr. Ragui uh, will be the speaker. And uh, before his re retirement, and this will be the last speech uh, in Ayas. So welcome all of you to join this Vesper program. And uh, if those uh, they don't know about this, we can inform them. So all of those, we can come to enjoy this uh, Vesper program. And also tomorrow, uh, we also we have the sub-school uh, started from A45 and uh, the divine worship uh, and also tomorrow afternoon we will continue we have the the session we can uh, read this uh, schedule uh, the following schedule and also tomorrow afternoon uh, after the the forum we have the question and answer session so if you have any question uh, about uh, our society or about uh, the uh, about the uh, theme of this uh, forum, please think about that and write down and we will collect the, the question uh, before that uh, start. So we will answer that question you raised. And also tomorrow, uh, at noon time, the lunch time, we will have the fellowship uh, potluck in the foyer of the amphitheater. So bring your food and we can join together for this uh, fellowship. So thank you so much for your participation uh, today and may God bless and we have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. Thank you so much, let's stand. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for today. You give us this wonderful opportunity that we can discuss how to make disciples in a special context of Asia. We know that there are many challenges, but we know that your grace are greater than any challenges. Let us all pray together. Let us all work together to the success of your great commission before your ascension. We, as now as we uh, finish today's session and we'll enter into your Sabbath, give all of us have happy Sabbath and all of us, we can enjoy your grace and enjoy our life in you. And we commit all of our 
foreign sessions in your hand. Please guide us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.